that uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the next lecturer. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mercedes Pasqual. Mercedes is a professor in the Ecology and Evolutionary Department uh, of the University of Chicago and an external faculty of the Santa Fe Institute. Her research focuses on uh, modeling and theory of the ecology and evolution of infection diseases, combining, uh, in a, my opinion, a unique way, highly conceptual theoretical question with highly applied ones. And today is giving the first lecture on uh, the ecoevolutionary dynamics in host pathogen systems and their assembly. So, Mercedes, uh, thank you very much for being virtually with us. <laughs> Yes, what can I do? Here I am. Okay. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Okay. Um, here I, let me just, okay. I see Jacopo here in my screen. <laughs> it works well. Yes, uh, I don't see myself. That's better. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Jacopo and Matteo, and also Simon and the organizers. So um, I will give this first lecture, and then um, I change a little bit my um, my program. The third lecture will not be on the, this interplay of ecology and evolution, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention. A little bit more about that at the end. So, but uh, today I like to follow up from what all you have heard about communities and talk about uh, assembly and coexistence, but no longer in the context of species, but uh, pathogen strains within a population uh, and uh, their inter interaction with a host. Mm -hmm. So this, this will concern the interplay of ecology and evolution in host pathogen systems. And uh, it will also be about assembly um, when we consider ecological interactions, but now as a function of explicit traits. And finally, there is a conceptual connection to what you heard yesterday uh, from uh, Jonathan uh, on stabilizing competitions and succession and I would like to emphasize frequency dependent selection. My real goal is to set the stage for what I want to tell you tomorrow about our work, um, rather than on, so, so anyhow, this is, this is intended as background uh, to tell you really uh, about uh, what I will call hyper-diverse systems in next lecture. So, oops, why is it that I can't go forward? Hmm. Jacopo? Uh, I don't know. Try to... Uh... Okay, let me try again. Okay, good. Ah, yes. So, um, and let me start with a quote from, from Simon, of all people, Simon Levin. Uh, this, is, this is from his uh, paper on complex adaptive systems, uh, where he wrote the fundamental problems in the study of any... Oh, what is it now that... The fundamental problems in the study of any complex system are understanding what maintains diversity and how the existence of diversity affects system dynamics. And he mentions it is these three features, heterogeneity and its maintenance, frequency dependence and modularity that complicate the picture and that will occupy most of my attention today. So uh, I will basically be telling you about frequency dependent interactions and frequency dependent selection, as you will see. And when we talk about, of course, uh, diversity in ecology, we almost uh, have two, two large camps. One uh, that emphasizes the sort of Gleasonian view that Stefano told about you, about uh, that emphasizes stochastic assembly and demography, the processes, the birth death processes of extinction immigration. And of course, we have there the neutral theory of Steve Howell. At the, um, in the other camp, we have approaches perhaps uh, traditionally more based on deterministic systems, but not necessarily, that emphasize interactions, ecological interactions. And I have here specific ecological interactions, 
uh, that uh, where differences between the species really matter. And uh, of course, this is very different from neutral theory, where we basically have an equivalence of species in this kind of uh, bird death processes. We heard from, uh, from Jonathan yesterday about the many uh, hypotheses, the many possible uh, mechanisms and explanations for, for coexistence uh, that, uh, that lie here. And of course, one of them involves this uh, limiting similarity uh, through niche partitioning, uh, character displacement, etc. And I like now to, to get back to this picture you saw yesterday to, to emphasize that besides help us organize uh, these different mechanisms, they also tell us about the different traits that uh, underlie um, these interactions. In the, the axis that was called niche differences, the traits really confer, as we heard, an advantage to the rare, but also a disadvantage to the common. So this is the axis where, the axis where we have frequency-dependent interactions, frequency-dependent selection when we start looking uh, from the perspective of evolution. The other axis, were, that, uh, which was called yesterday uh, fitness differences, really re uh, relates to traits that confer absolute fixed advantages. And what I will talk about today will lie um, on the, uh, the x-axis here. So I will consider that the strains vary only in their frequencies dynamically, but not um, much, but not really on their um, on the y-axis. And of course, the, the, the realm of the y-axis for pathogens concerns the reproductive number R0. So really uh, there we have this, of course, the exclusion of the, the pathogen with the lower R0. And there, are, there is, uh, Inter, well, there, there are mathematical studies of those kinds of interactions. Now, you can tell me why am I uh, talking here about competition? Perhaps it's obvious to some of you. I like to, to remind everybody, and especially those that are not interested in pathogens but like ecology, that infectious diseases are consumer resource systems. They are essentially um, natural oscillators where the infections uh, are the consumers and the resource are the hosts. And when we do not consider any strain differences in the typical uh, susceptible infected recover system, uh, where we have, um, where individuals uh, acquire immunity and that removes them from the pool of resources, um, we have essentially this uh, generalized competition for the resources. When we have specific, uh, when we have now specific immunity, we will have something more interesting. And of course, the traits that matter here are the variant surface antigens, the molecules that the immune system recognizes. So one advantage of thinking about, of, about competition between strains is that we really, um, know what are the traits we should be looking at. So what are the traits that underlie competition for hosts? And this is an example in influenza uh, in this diagram where we have, of course, the, the well-known uh, glycoproteins that are on the surface of the cell, in particular hemagglutinin, and uh, the, this uh, variable protein is the major antigen of influenza, there is a second. So when we hear about uh, H2N2, H1N1, we are referring to the big types of this, uh, um, of essentially the big classification of the, 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 the subtypes of, the, of, of influenza. Now, in, you see here to the right, H3N2, and uh, a typical tree, of uh, the seasonal influenza H3 and 2, where the colors, uh, essentially, well, this is, of course, um, a tree 
from uh, from the from the genetic sequences but what you see with the colors here are the the, the different clusters corresponding to different phenotypes so these are seen by the immune system as distinct and we and these can be uh, really um, tested with with assays and and so we know that uh, that there are these these clusters now what is interesting about this tree and has led to a lot of interesting theory is uh, not the high diversity the opposite the limiting diversity at any given time so you have here a dynamics of replacement with short branches and um, it has puzzled people uh, why is it that given this very fast evolution of the virus in theory we don't have uh, the branches persist why don't we have much more diversity of h3 and 2 globally this led to interesting theory and to a and essentially to a field um, not by itself, not just that question that was introduced by, by Brian Grantrell and others in terms of its name, uh, phylodynamics, where we look uh, at the essentially the influence of population dynamics on the structure of the trees, and then how does the how does the structure feedback onto the population dynamics? The I like to briefly uh, mention in passing two um, well-known papers in this area, just to emphasize that there are studies that have relied on computational models that track both genotype and phenotype. Essentially, the genetic sequences of the viruses and then how they map to the phenotype. Essentially, to the traits I'm talking about, this antigenic variation on the surface of the viruses. And this is one paper by Neil Ferguson and others in Nature, uh, where essentially they, they noted that, of course, the trees that, that tend to be um, extremely um, explosive in terms of diversity, and it is not easy to, to get these short branches. The explanation they provided for the short branches uh, was that of short term, what they call strain transcending immunity. So this is not, uh, this is generalized immunity. If you get infected by any strain, uh, you are protected, you are no longer a resource, and therefore this is a generalized competition uh, that, that works in this regard. An alternative uh, explanation was um, provided by by Katia Cole and uh, well I, I'm in this paper too and um, this was a paper that relied on this idea of a complex genotype phenotype map the idea that we know that in flu um, although the the genotype varies with time in a continuous way the phenotypic change of the virus is punctuated so this is an observation, an empirical observation from a paper by Derek Smith and colleagues. But uh, what Katya uh, proposes in this paper is essentially an interesting genotype phenotype map that I will not uh, describe in detail, but I want to mention because this returns later. We're essentially, and this map is implemented with the idea of neutral networks. And this was, this was a sketch here in a commentary on the paper, where essentially the nodes of these networks, of these networks are sequences, the different um, colors correspond to sequences that map to different uh, antigens. And you see that mutation moves you around, that's uh, innovation. So you can move around and not change uh, color in a sense. Once you change color, you have a great advantage. So you have a selective sweep. Uh, then you, you explore again this new one and you go on and on. She showed, uh, we showed in this paper that essentially this, this, uh, this discontinuous mapping between uh, the, the genetic distance and the phenotypic one allow you to have this uh, limited this limited uh, effect on diversity. 
But again, these are, comp these are complex very complex systems that rely on knowing something about the genotype to phenotype map and the computational models in implement uh, these ideas in some complex code. But I like to get back to simpler models after this somewhat brief introduction. But because before phylodynamics, there was a large field I'm going to call strain theory that look at the competition of strains and, um, for hosts and questions of diversity. And um, in, here I will mention the work of uh, Sunatra Gupta and focus on work now that does not consider uh, the genotype at all, but focuses directly on the traits, that is the antigenic identity of the pathogens. And it's interesting in this, uh, in this sort of uh, seminal paper by Sunetra and Karen Day to see that they were, they were motivated by malaria and, and the question of malaria in very endemic regions and the question of if there is such high transmission and people get infected so much, will it ever be possible to control malaria through vaccination? So we can return to these questions tomorrow when we get to malaria, because that's truly a very hyperdiverse system. Now, the early, um, the early models, I should say there is, as I said, a large literature, and I'll provide, provide at the end of this talk some references for those of you who are interested. There are a series of more analytical studies on, um, on the dynamics, analyzing models with multiple strains. But I like to focus here on models that in particular consider combinations of traits. So phenotypes that are essentially combinatorial in nature, right? Because we don't have, so this is not like, okay, strain I, strain J, right? The identity of the strains will emerge from a pool of variation and from a combination of traits. And I think that is important, and I'll return, I'll return to that tomorrow to give you a sense for why. And here we can choose to go with a discrete or a, or a continuous space, and I'm going to start with a discrete uh, trade space. So you have to visualize here the representation as uh, a pathogen having a set of, I'm going to call them sites or loci, each of those represents an antigen. You may find in the literature the word, the word epitope, that's the part of the molecule that, the, that uh, the immune system recognizes. And for each of these uh, antigens, we have a finite number of possible variants as represented. So essentially a strain is a combination of these uh, variants. So for example, we may have three epitopes or three antigens, uh, one with three variants, another with four, another with five, and then a strain is, is a combination. These are not linked, they don't need to, they, they are not physically linked, but we, are, we will see that they can become dynamically linked. So one of the possible outcomes in, in the, if you write models for these kinds of systems, and here I have sketched the simplest possible case of, well, two var essentially two antigens with two variants each. So there are four possibilities. And uh, what happens under some parameter regimes is that, uh, of course, uh, as you let the, the model go, the ones that have some overlap uh, will be selected against because they, they, they are at a disadvantage. And the mole goes towards this state that, that is this discordant state in which there is no, no overlap between the coexisting types. So we have hosts now that are immune to Y and B so they can get uh, infected by this virus XA and the other way around. And I have this here just to let you see that essentially the niches that have emerged are these uh, groups of hosts with different histories, of, with different memories. And so it is these different groups of hosts 
that are the niches that emerge from this frequency dependent essentially advantage of the rare disadvantage of the common and you can see here that this depends strongly on the intensity of competition we will see the equations in a moment if there is very weak uh, effect of cross immunity so if i'm infected by another uh, kind my memory does not in influence what happens next of course there is no strain structure at the limit of very strong immune selection we get this emergence of niches uh, with this uh, stable discrete strain structure of the strains that have limited overlap now when we write these equations i have um, borrowed i want to show you a little bit the, the equations that uh, gupta and colleagues wrote just for, for to show some 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 equations and i also like the way they simplify the notation of the system by defining uh, the state variables in a particular way i have also uh, borrowed this from a paper a methodological paper they wrote uh, uh, after they had proposed all these ideas because this comes from this comes a company with an r package that embeds some C code, and this is called Mantis. If you like to write and play with these kinds of things, uh, you can go to this paper and download that code. But what you can see here is that we have in this uh, two by two systems, the, the state variables, the Zs here, Z, A, X, are the, uh, is the proportion of the population that has seen uh, the has been infected and has memory to strain a x more interesting is the definition of the variable y uh, sorry uh, w in which you basically take um, the union with all those other uh, essentially memories right that have some overlap with a x so that either have a or x and you do that for every uh, pathogen. There is a typo here in the blue. This should be B, uh, BX, not, not AX, but you see the picture. So uh, just to, to show you that this simplifies greatly the notation because now for a given, uh, of course, there would be additional equations for other types, but uh, you can see here in particular the equation for Y, which is the infected. Um, sorry, Jacopo, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, the sort of typical epidemiological models have been shown, right, by Marino, right? Yes, yes, Marino has uh, discussed yes, that. Yes, he has gone farther, obviously farther, but here you can see uh, we have Z, uh, W, and this, you can see how easily we can now write the equation for the infections, which uh, this Y are the infected, and you can see that we have, okay, beta, the transmission rate, then the infected with AX, but that now we have these two kinds of susceptibles, the one minus W have never seen uh, AX, so they are fully susceptible, while the, the Ws minus those that have full, full protection uh, have a reduction in their susceptibility. This is the cross immunity. And this parameter gamma has the intensity, is the intensity of the competition or this cross immunity um, because you can see essentially if, if gamma is, is uh, one, right, uh, you, you basically, any exposure, right, uh, will protect you completely um, even if you don't, haven't seen both types, if you just have seen one of the types. So in the, in this um, initial paper, one of the initial papers in science by Sunetra and colleagues, you can see here that uh, gamma, if you look at the bifurcation diagram on the bottom, that of course this intensity of competition or cross immunity gamma is very important to the dynamical uh, regime you see. Uh, of course, if gamma is weak enough, you see no strain structure. If you move to the right, uh, completely to the right, we, we get to this, uh, what they call a discordant set, which is like the, the sort of complete limit, uh, no overlap between the, the essentially the, the steady state here. And then in the middle, we have the either periodic or chaotic uh, cycles with some 
uh, replacement. And uh, this picture is a little busy, but just to emphasize those transitions, if you look in the center uh, for, for one of these variable Ws, the bifurcation diagram, uh, moving from the left to the right, uh, you get uh, essentially a steady state with everybody there. Uh, you go through these uh, more uh, cyclic or chaotic dynamics, and finally completely to the right, uh, one of the discordant sets. Of course, there are multiple discordant sets and which one you reach uh, will depend on the where you start uh, and as we will see um, the history of this. Now, I um, provided before some explanations for the limited uh, diversity of influenza uh, H3N2 and um, in a paper in PNAS 2006, this uh, model that I just showed you was revisited uh, as an explanation, an alternative explanation to the one I gave you. Essentially, this limited set of possible, uh, of possible um, strains, right, um, would lead to, could lead under some parameters in this cyclic or more chaotic regime to something resembling influenza. Now, that's where when um, we got together with Sunetra Gupta in, in reaction to that paper, because um, when you look at those models, in particular, in the deterministic version, uh, obviously there is no stochastic extinction, but more important, in these models, there was no explicit evolution. And by that, I mean, there was, of course, the change in frequencies, and you can call that evolution, but there was no explicit mutation. There was no explicit uh, innovation. So we started with all the, the pool of variation in the system. And what happened was that, the, of course, the abundances, the relative proportions went up and down. And when you have the discordant sets, um, you basically get um, some dominant coexisting ones. But in the fluctuating, fluctuating regime, you can always be rescued from these low levels, right? Nothing goes uh, completely extinct. So we wanted to see what happens when we essentially take these models and really uh, look at evolution. And again, there is a literature, an analytical literature, uh, and I'll get to that later, but here um, we don't want to separate the timescales of evolution and ecology or evolution and epidemiology because, um, well, essentially for these pathogens, that separation does not necessarily apply. So we will be talking about mutation. And I should remind you that since we don't want to track genotypes and we don't want to deal with genotype phenotype maps, we are going to basically go uh, call mutation uh, a phenotypic change. So I may, ch I may go from one uh, epitope to another variant of this epitope in, in the pool of possible variation. But uh, we are not going to track uh, genotype. And this does not preclude us from looking at the tree. We will have individual base models, stochastic individual base models, where we can track the infection history of each host in time. And uh, because we do that, and the risk of infection then given a contact will depend on your immune history, whether you are protected, how much cross immunity you have. We can, in fact, we don't need to reconstruct the, the genealogy in the way trees are built, because since we know the whole history, we can sample it. And basically we know the parent of any virus. So we can construct the tree computationally as we go along. So in that sense, we don't really need to track the genotype. So this was done in this paper by, by Zinder and colleagues. It was also done in a, paper, in a paper by Trevor Bedford. I'll show you in a moment. And just uh, to give you uh, a few more details about this, uh, here on the right, uh, as I said, we can follow the tree. So we can also measure diversity, uh, genetic diversity, for example, uh, by going back from two viruses back to a common ancestor and this uh, time 
the time to the common ancestor is a measure of that genetic diversity. On the, on the ecological side, um, rather than having this cross immunity given just that, that you ha have seen one of the epitopes, we mold that a bit differently. We said the risk of infection will depend on the fraction of the epitopes, so the fraction of these traits you have seen before. And uh, of course, here you see that a parameter sigma, as we move sigma down here, the intensity of competition, so how important it is to have seen a certain fraction goes up. I did uh, place down here a quantity um, that tells you whether we are seeing some positive or negative selection in the system. We adapted an, um, an index from McDonald Kreidman for, 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 uh, to look at selection. Uh, here, we basically count or, or compute the mutation rates on the trunk of the tree compared to the rate of mutations on the side branches. So the side branches are those that will go extinct, as you see here in black. Uh, from the end of the simulation, you can tra trace back the trunk. Those are the ones that have become fixed in the system. And so this um, ratio will give you, uh, essentially when it is bigger than one, we have positive selection. When it is below one, you have negative selection of uh, mutations. So the main result I want to show you is here. Remember that from, well, perhaps I was not clear enough, in the work before, in the purely ecological work without explicit mutation, the parameter that was very important for the bifurcation diagrams was the intensity of competition. Here, um, I want to show you the effect of the speed of evolution, of the mutation rate on the emergent structure and, and shape of the tree. So we start on the left uh, by comparison with essentially the completely neutral case where uh, there are no antigenic mutations. So we still get the tree, but all are equivalent. So this is the neutral tree. As we move to the right with mutation a bit higher in this particular example, we see uh, this regime of positive selection with the, the, the index I just described uh, clearly above one, and um, these short branches, a short diversity, genetic diversity. This is the flu-like regime, the H3N2 regime. Now, if we move to the right, and now we, antigenic mutation is even faster, <clears throat> we get a more interesting situation, at least if we are interested in diversity, um, I have to say I have cut the tree here just for the purpose of the figure. These purple and, um, and orange branches join in the, in the past, uh, so they, they, they are two coexisting um, uh, branch, a set of branches. So you see uh, what we would call these discordance sets where now mutations may come in but get selected against because essentially the niche, the niches uh, in the host have been established at least temporarily uh, by these coexisting types. So we see here that these different dynamical regimes uh, are very influenced by the speed of evolution and that to achieve the coexistence of discordant strains, so the emergence of niches in this system, Evolution needs to be fast enough to explore trade space and for this essentially, yes, uh, equivolutionary dynamics to assemble niches with limiting similarity. That may be a bit counterintuitive. If we go a little bit faster, or it, I mean, if we go faster, of course, at some point, uh, we lose the pattern we are going to have essentially just a random pattern with variation on top of the tree. Oops, did I uh, write on my slides or did you write on my slides, Jacopo? Uh, I'm not sure, but now <laughs> it doesn't I matter. I just, uh, I just was oh. wondering if you are interfering. So I will um, st stop in a moment to see if there are temporary questions. 
But I wanted to, to mention that um, all this does not depend on, of course, having a discrete space. And we had a discrete space that was limited. I mean, here in the paper, in the paper by Zinder, you will find an application to flu where, where we simulate with uh, the tropics, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere. So we try to see whether we can get uh, the flu-like dynamics with uh, realistic parameters. But we consider essentially five epitopes and each has a certain number of variants. So there is a limited space and that limited space has been emphasized in the past. I like to show you that in continuous trade space with this uh, no limit to, to the different types, you can get essentially the same dynamics. And this continuous trade space is, uh, has a very strong empirical connection uh, motivated by the, the work, uh, the very elegant work of Derek Smith and colleagues uh, looking at data on the virus. And what you see here on the right is really what is called an antigenic map. So you can look at distances in a map that tells you how similar these viruses are. This is not like just an imaginary space. This is derived from data. Uh, we have for these viruses, and this has been used for a long time to produce vaccines, Essentially, you can test one virus against an another for how much cross protection it gives you. There are these immunoassays done in ferrets that uh, allow you from those tables then to define a distance. And uh, the very interesting idea of uh, Derek Smith was to, to define that distance from those tables and then uh, ask how many dimensions do we need to describe H3N2 influenza. And they found that you need a few dimensions with two dominant ones. And you can see in this plot that there is indeed one dominant one that corresponds to this tree with very short branches, right? And you are moving from 68 on the top down with a, a little bit of fluctuation in a second dimension, but it's very one dimensional corresponding to this limiting diversity of flu. In this model, so this is a model by, um, Let's see if I have, well, I'll have the reference later by uh, Trevor Bedford when he was in my lab with uh, Rambo and myself. This model uh, now lives in a continuous and dimensional space. Here, I'm, I'm going to start with two dimensions and now a phenotype is just a vector in that space. So we can look at uh, what happens in this kind of representation. Importantly, the mutation here is where the trick of this model comes in a sense. So the mutation occurs at the rate. This is a stochastic model. It's an individual based model as before. And when a mutation occurs, then the, the phenotype, uh, you choose the direction at random, but the size of the mutation was chosen from a gamma distribution. And this was based on some empirical data the idea of a gamma distribution comes here from the important, the parameters we chose. Most of these steps are going to be small, but eventually you'll have a bigger step. And this is essentially a phenomenological representation of what Katya Cole did with this, with this uh, genotype phenotype map represented here in this simpler way. So that is essential. And I'd like to just show you that this uh, implementation recovers all the characteristics of flu. We have it here with uh, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and the tropics, uh, because there is different seasonality in those parts of the world. And of course, the, 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 the virus travels around. You can see the replacement dynamics, you can see the short branches of the tree. And on the right in B, you see the two antigenic dimensions. The virus moves predominantly in one direction. Uh, and in the bottom, we just added the noise that, of the size that is typical of these kinds of measurements. But that's more or less what we should see. You can ask yourself, did it matter that we started in two dimensions? 
it doesn't seem to matter if you run this model and you start, for example, with 10 dimensions, what emerges for the flu-like parameters of H3 and 2 is, all, is also just this uh, one, largely one-dimensional trajectory shown here uh, by showing the principal components of this antigenic space where you see that, for example, PC1 against PC2, you are moving in time to the right, uh, essentially mostly along one dimension. And you see that, uh, well, anyhow, in other projections. So, so these dynamics did not depend uh, strongly on this uh, limit, on assuming two dimensions. Now, before I, I uh, ask whether there are questions for this part of the talk, I like to refer you, for those of you who are interested, to this paper by Trevor Bedford and colleagues in, um, in Nature, which followed, and uh, which shows, th these actually are trees from data, so they are uh, very interesting empirical trees. And I want to show you that, of course, the, as usual, the, the connection between the structure and dynamics um, there are many, um, well, there are other factors that, that matter be besides the speed of evolution and the intensity uh, of the cross protection. Here um, we have the observed trees we've uh, reconstructed from, um, from sequences for H3 and 2. Now you are familiar with it, except the colors here have to do uh, with their. Uh, geographical location. You have H1N1, another subtype within influenza A, and then two types of the influenza B that are um, less prevalent. And you see that the trees vary. A very interesting thing here is that H1N1 and the other flu uh, viruses are known to um, evolve genetically they, they mutate as fast, but phenotypically, they are not capable of changing as much. So the traits that matter to competition in H1N1 are not changing as rapidly as H3N2. What this paper then proposes is that, of course, then um, these changes, the, essentially what is happening is that you are reducing the overall, the general pool of, of cost, right? Faster for H1N1 because, because the virus is not moving away fast enough. And therefore you are moving more towards what I would call neutral dynamics, but in a way that interacts here with the geography because the new, mu the new types are coming from, from mostly from East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And so, so what you have is this new, in, this, uh, in the, the model that is presented in this paper, you also have um, this uh, more detailed um, in, uh, in immigration patterns. And to show you the complexity of this, if the essentially you are, um, you are reducing overall susceptibles more, you are reducing the age of infection to, towards children farther, and the children travel less. So you are uh, having this interaction of travel, age of infection, and intensity of competition. I mentioned that because in, there is a parallel uh, work in phylodynamics that really goes into inference. And when you hear about community phylogenetics and all the efforts to use community patterns in species to say something about the underlying forces that are at play, I would like you to have a pitch for essentially inference. So you may have your hypothesis, but you may have to connect your models to the data. The machinery for doing that in viruses where we have sequences uh, and, and phenotypes as a function of time exist. And uh, there is an, a lot of interesting work at this interface with statistics. So just to show you that here, the demography, the competition and the speed of evolution 
are interacting to shape the trees. So what inference we can make, okay, what explanations we have for the trees and what do, do they tell us in terms of how to intervene, how easy it may be to control the evolutionary drift of the virus. Uh, all of that requires this sort of going back and forth with the data. Okay, I'm going to take a break here um, for questions. Yes, there is uh, uh, one question by uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Yes, I, I, this, is, this is really interesting. In the, in the models, for example, in the neutral tree that you show from the Cinder paper, what, what is the source of the oscillations? What causes the rate yeah, of that, infections to yeah, oscillate? This is uh, an interesting question. And uh, um, here, what is the source? For, um, we, we have seasonal transmission in this, in this model. Now, we, and I assume this is what is causing it here because it's very regular, but, uh, but I would say that, you, that we would also have in these neutral models because of the equivalence, because of the complete equivalence, we would have also the possibility of uh, cycling because you are basically uh, eating up the susceptibles and having to wait for those to be replenished by births. So in the typical, if you take the paradigmatic studies of nonlinear dynamics in disease, um, you have of course a tendency of, of, uh, of disease systems to oscillate. That tendency is essentially a damp cycle going to equilibrium. But then you, and then when it interacts with seasonality, you can get more complex patterns because you have two cycles interacting, right? So, so we could have even in, a, in the neutral case, in fact, measles, measles, which has been studied and is the sort of more, as I said, paradigmatic studies of what we understand in epidemiology, uh, measles is largely neutral because measles is a virus and this is why the vaccine works so well. The, uh, measles mutates, but it cannot change antigenically. It cannot effectively change antigenically. So it's mutating, but it's, it's neutral because for the ones you are infected, uh, so essentially every, every, uh, every virus is competing. It's a form of generalized competition that is neutral. So it's interesting to think about those parallels just because if I'm a host, I got measles or I got vaccinated, I'm removed. I'm no longer a resource. Right, and in the, in the paper later, later on, when, when you simulate these dynamics and show that you can re reconstruct the, the similar dynamics from the real data, uh, are, the, are in those simulations, are you imposing that seasonal Yes, they are, they, yes. Okay. and I have not gone in, enough into those details in some simulations like here we have, I have to remember here, here we have seasonality in this paper. We also have a figure with the tree, uh, the simpler ge uh, geographic structure, right? The tropics where there is, because the, the very interesting thing is that seasonality influences persistence. So the, the, um, a, a, away from the tropics, the seasonality is stronger. And for example, persistence in the Northern hemisphere or the temperate regions is not high. And so essentially a lot of the persistence is in the tropics. And there is also a typical movement from the North to the South. And so there is the very interesting, there has been a lot of inferential work on, the, on looking at the, the origin, uh, where is the trunk? So essentially, where is the trunk of these trees in the, in the, in the world, right? Because that tells you the, the ones that, that um, the, the mutations that eventually can uh, become fi uh, fixed, where do they come from? And it's very interesting to see where is the trunk, uh, where do these mutants, these effective mutants come from? Thank you. Up here you can see the trunk right in the, right. <laughs> in the different places and the, yeah, it's kind of interesting. There is a, uh, another question from Gabriel. 
Yeah, I was uh, wondering about the result you showed for the high dimensional phenotype. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, so is it because of the specific way that flu works that you're, in, you're assuming that uh, there's immunity towards past strains that it's always 1D? Like why can't we see like limit cycles, yeah, oscillations or something? Yeah, good question. There is a nice picture uh, Trevor Bedford does magnificent work. In fact, I should point you to all to the page he has, his websites. He has developed something called Next Flu which uh, monitors on real time, does predictions of the next uh, virus on real time and so on. So uh, he has a picture of that landscape, that evolutionary landscape in this paper. And you, and you see exactly what you said. Uh, what happens is that, that the virus, uh, there is this sort of wave of immunity behind it. And it sort of has to move forward. But it's interesting if in this model, and this is a toy model, of course, if you mutate uh, a bit faster, not that much faster, you will bifurcate and you will have coexisting, uh, you know, the, the regime I showed you before in which you don't get replacements, but you get coexistence of, of types. And so probably, of course, uh, reality always has a mixture of hypotheses, and so there, ha there is a generalized immunity that was uh, proposed, the generalized immunity that was proposed by Neil Ferguson as the original mechanism that gives you the short branches is also probably at play, helping with this, preventing those bifurcations, right? And uh, uh, in these models you can get it, but you, of course you have to have the speed of evolution right. Otherwise, the system will bifurcate and will find niches and coexistence, and then you get this uh, coexisting regime. But what about the uh, oscillations? Can you ever get like uh, yeah, this know, is, the, the immunity chasing the, the virus? Yeah, this, uh, is a, this is a very interesting question because in this paper that uh, uh, I like to go back here, sorry, here at the bottom, I, I, I like to point you to in this paper by Recker uh, and colleagues in PNAS, they did propose that this mall, essentially this, uh, this uh, mall of, um, from strain theory that Sunetra had proposed earlier was an explanation for flu. And that's this discrete mall where you have this, uh, essentially a limited number of possib combinatorial possibilities. And so in theory, what you should see at some point is the system cycling back to, to th which has never been seen for H3 and 2. So of course in their paper they argue that um, some interesting, there are some interesting issues about how we get the data uh, from the assays, these immunoassays and you know which virus we test against past viruses, right, and whether uh, we have seen there is a question, have we looked enough, long enough in time to see the cycles or are we sampling in the right way to see the, sun, the cycles? I would say most people uh, would feel more comfortable. I don't know where reality is. I don't think that this limited, diver limited pool of variation is an important hypothesis for explaining the patterns. Uh, now how whether an assumption of a completely infinite space like here is, is, is reasonable, it's hard to tell. So far, so far we have not seen any of these viruses return in a cyclic fashion. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Great, I don't see any other question, uh, so. Do I have time, 10 more minutes? Yes. 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 People must be very tired after this long day, but let me let me do this because I uh, yeah I like to do this. So um, before I, I go on, I wanted to just stop here for a moment and point out again for those of you who uh, are really tired of now listening to about I mean this lecture about strains that there are very strong conceptual analogies. Uh, to what we see, would see in ecological systems if we start essentially model, modeling this frequency-dependent competition 
um, essentially along the Cheson axis of uh, niche differences. And this was done uh, in this paper. I'd like to direct you to this paper by Schaefer and Van Ness in PNAS, where they have a niche axis. It's a one dimensional niche axis. Uh, this is essentially a, a, a version of the MacArthur and Levin's model, but with evolution. So you have uh, time running down and you start with these pieces that can mutate and are competing as a function of distance. And the only thing I like to notice at the end is that what persists in this discordant, uh, discordant state here is these clusters. These clusters, so it's, these are species uh, and they are not one species at a distance of another species, it is these clusters of similar species away from another cluster of similar species, very similar to the model I just showed you in continuous space for flu, except that this one was done in one dimension. These communities do not talk to each other. Uh, I'll mention yet, uh, tomorrow further, uh, well, sorry, Thursday, some further analogies. Here, I wanted to, to leave you with an example, where we'll do this quickly, of uh, another virus, because you can say, well, flu motivated all this work, but is there evidence for the discordant regime in nature? Essentially, the emergence of these kinds of niches. In the work by Gupta, uh, Caroline Baki, and so on, they talk about the meningococcus virus. We, you will see some empirical evidence. I like to um, mention here this other virus. This, this is an uh, rotavirus, the main uh, cause of diarrheal disease in children and mortality due to diarrheal disease worldwide. This is a virus with, uh, it's a double-stranded RNA virus. It has on the surface, on this sort of uh, nice picture that they drew here, uh, we have two types, two main, two or three, but let's say two main um, determinant molecules that determine the, the G types and then the P types. So those are different parts of the capsule of the virus. And I like to show you that if you look at uh, here the uh, genealogy of the G types, uh, you'll see this coexistence. This is the global data set that exists for this segment. Um, essentially, the segment is the segment that encodes the G type. If you do these trees, uh, you find this coexistence that goes back to very, 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 very long time. And if you look at the population dynamics, you also see coexistence here on the right, on the top, uh, with some fluctuations and, of course, uh, some new types that are coming like the green because this virus um, is of zoonotic origin and we get uh, new viruses that come uh, from animals into humans and introduce. So we have not just mutation, but we have uh, novelty through immigration. And I just like to point out that we have, we did an individual based model with three, three of these proteins just to mention that now the risk of infection again depends on distance, but we have two components here on the, on the, in this formula. One is generalized. So if you have been infected before, you are protected. And that is believed to be the strongest protection against this virus. We added some specific protection with the sigma specific, depending on the fraction of these three uh, types you have seen before. And this, um, this specific immunity is much believed to be much weaker in this virus. Now, this virus is messy because I said you get immigration, but you also get reassortment. So these segments, uh, you get uh, essentially recombination in these viruses, it's called reassortment. So you get this genetic mixing. So can you get any structure in the presence of this kind of genetic mixing that is uh, essentially you, it's a force against this, uh, just these simple lineages through mutation. I just want to tell you that in a model of this, uh, you see here an example where there is no reassortment, the colors, I'm just uh, stacking up the, the abundance of the different viruses in colors. The colors represent a different combination, a different strain. 
the red strain invaded, and you see that we, on the bottom, we are basically look at the number of share segments. If you are on just share, sharing segments in the diagonal, you are purely discordant. And you see that these introductions get you some overlap temporarily, and then the system reorganizes into the discordant states. Uh, if you get reassortment, of course, you will get only partial discordance. But this force, this force, this frequency dependent uh, competition is still uh, leaving a strong signature of partial discordance. And I like to show you this wonderful, there is not enough data for this virus. There is nothing compared to, to flu, but I wanted to show you this because I think it's an, well, an incredible pattern, possibly of niches in nature. If you take uh, the global data set that exists and take, uh, you map it to the percentage of samples here on the left that have a certain G and a certain T, uh, P type. So the, the, the red colors are the most abundant, the blue the least abundance. You see that we have a lot of G1P8, some G2P4. So it looks like there is not that much overlap between these dominant things, but you can say, well, maybe Maybe this is just because of their frequencies and it has nothing to do with a force acting uh, like a negative frequency dependent selection. So on the right, I sh I'll show you what is the probability of um, essentially is if you look at what you would expect uh, from the frequencies, the global frequencies of the, of the corresponding G's and P's, do you have a positive or a negative deviation and how significant it is? You can do this with randomizations. You can also do it with certain statistical tests here with randomizations in red. It's in red, we have the very, uh, the sort of, um, the deviations that are positive, right? That uh, under P value and you, you see that, of course, we have, much, we have much more G1P8 and G2P4 than we expect at random, but more interestingly, some of the later arrivals, like uh, G6 or G12, they have come in, and of course, there is a lot here on the left of them associated with P8 because there is a lot of P8 around, but if you look at the deviations, they are deviating positively towards places that were not occupied by these dominant types. So there is somehow this uh, movement of the system to limit similarity. I, maybe I could end there or I can show you a little bit more, but I don't want to, you know, maybe I can end there. How, are we, how, how am I doing with type? I, maybe I'll go to the conclusion. So we are uh, five minutes past. Uh, yeah, so let me just conclude. Yeah. I just wanted to show you that because it is a nice picture of this discordant state possibly in nature. And this makes the point that uh, we can get this non overlapping repertoires, in this case, even with weak cross immunity. And that this frequency dependent selection can remain this effect of what we would call niche differences, sense of. Chesson, but in a context of evolution, can remain apparent despite this mixing by reassortment and despite immigration, of course, depending on the relative strength here of these processes. So, and that this, this data shows patterns consistent with uh, niche partitioning, uh, this emergent niche partitioning. But what are we missing? And I like to get to that tomorrow. I will not touch much on functional differences or barriers to reassortment. Essentially, how does this uh, axis interact with the other axis in, 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 in Chesson, which is a very interesting idea. But we haven't explored a lot. How do we compare the patterns to what we expect under neutrality, which is a very important question. And because, and I have been talking about limiting diversity, I really want to talk about diversity and I want to talk about hyperdiversity. So tomorrow I will present a system where the diversity of the number, the pool of variation is so large that you will say, well, there can't be any structure here. And I hope to surprise you by showing you, by showing you
that we may be in a regime that is the complete opposite of neutrality and where specific interactions are incredibly important and are seen in the patterns we see in nature and that to see those patterns because we have recombination we are going to use not trees but networks and networks will allow us to look at the structure that emerges from the underlying processes so this is where i'm going to go uh, tomorrow uh, to hyper diverse systems hopefully uh, connecting with the more analytical work that Daniel Fisher will show us. I think there are some conceptual connections to that. And here are some papers uh, for those of you who may be interested in some more mathematical aspects of uh, competition between strains and in particular at the end some attempts to use population genetics to explain um, the patterns I just showed you for flu. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mercedes, for the uh, very nice uh, lecture. So we have uh, a few uh, more minutes for uh, questions, if uh, any. Please use the raise hand uh, feature. Okay, I don't see any. So otherwise, I mean, um, we will be back with Mercedes uh, tomorrow, right? Um, yes, I don't have the program. No, I think Thursday. On Thursday, on Thursday, yes, I don't have the program. Um, yes, yeah, so. I should say, Jacopo, the third lecture will not be anymore on diversity or whatever, because uh, yes. as we discussed, um, since, yes, this, this was about quantitative approaches in ecology, uh, I, I like to talk a little bit about uh, climate, urbanization, and vector borne diseases. Um, so, so different aspects from diversity, which of course uh, fits more with what other people have been talking, but I like to go a little bit there. Yes, absolutely. But I mean, uh, this is to say that if there are more questions, there will be, if question arises, there will be time to answer them and this video will be available on, uh, on YouTube, so you can rewatch it.